John Bolger with Premier Guitar, and I'm with Paul Reed Smith at uh, at the Paul, Paul Reed Smith factory. And Paul, I can't thank you enough for uh, letting us come here and see behind the uh, behind the curtain, see how it's all done. We've shown you things we've not shown anybody. <laughs> I know. Well, it's I'm good, going, right? Uh, it, yeah, it's amazing. It's ama it's. Well, at least it's, you like it. You're smiling. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am. I am giddy. I am legitimately legitimately giddy. About being here, just uh, just meeting you, seeing what you're doing, and and thinking about like, when did this all start for you? This when did you right, start? I'll answer the question, but there's 425 people here. It's not just me, <laughs> okay? But it Fair started enough. with you, absolutely. Uh, okay, A great okay, team. Okay, but it's always been teamwork. So what's the question exactly? When did this start? And it right. was it was fair enough. When did the thing with you and guitar start? What year? Oh, me? Yeah. Uh, in eighth grade. Got the bug. And what year was that? That was um, 78, I guess. Yeah, okay, 78. For me, it started a little earlier. Yeah. So <laughs> when I was probably 15, my brother took me to, at the time, which was now then a Kmart, kind of, but yeah. when the Beatles records came out, there would literally be a stack of Beatles records as big as this room because they had done enough, enough advanced ordering and, they, and people came from everywhere to buy them, right? It was no internet. Sure. And he showed me a record. It was a, at the time, it wasn't a CD or, or a you know, stick. It was a you know, big piece of cardboard, right? Yeah. And there was a guy, a black guy, on the cover with a big fro and two <laughs> eyes on his shirt and two white guys next to him with fros on their, on their heads. And he goes, these guys are huge in England, and they're going to be huge here. And I went, yeah, no need to so seriously, right? Now, now when the things came, they came with a cellophane on them, right? Yeah, yeah. So my brother, come, we go home, and, and he says, I got some errands to do. So he leaves. And I see this picture of this guy with his two eyes on his shirt. And I went, and I, I took the cellophane off, and I put it on. It starts with fire, ends with are you experienced? Yeah. I was not the same. I couldn't deal with what I just heard. People were playing guitar so they get dates. I didn't care about that. I wanted to play the guitar. I like the sound of it, you know? So for me, my mother bringing home Meet the Beatles or us being at a, uh, at the time, a jukebox and, and playing She Loves You a hundred times, you know? Yeah. Or, um, you know, Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs in a restaurant going, Riddle, Riddle. Right, or whatever it <laughs> yeah, was, right? right? All this extra extraordinary music. James Brown was theme song was W A N N. That's W Annapolis. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I would walk in the house and popcorn would be on, or you know, Cold Sweat would be on, or it was just unbelievable what was going on. How would you not get addicted to that? And the thing that was making all these sounds was an electric guitar and people's voices, obviously drums and bass and yeah. all stuff. But I remember, you know, I was one of the first people to ever get my hands on the Led Zeppelin record with Stairway to Heaven. I didn't care about the first part. I liked it when the band kicked in, so I would, like, lower the needle <laughs> or the band kicker. I, mean, I, I, got, I got the bug a little earlier than you, but yeah. not much. Yeah. It was, it was wonderful. I loved it. And you've just been chasing the tone ever since. Well, look, I wanted to be a guitar player. But if I played guitar at Washington Music, everybody would run away like oil and water. <laughs> but if I opened a case of something I made, it would draw a crowd. And I was like, that ain't right. <laughs> but I had to pay attention to the feedback of the world. They were interested in the guitars. They weren't interested in the way I played. So when did you build your first guitar? Well, that's an interesting definition. If you build a body for a neck somebody else has made, is that building a guitar? In my world, it's when you make your first neck. Oh, sure. So, so to me, putting the truss rod in, gluing the fretboard on, slotting the fingerboard, putting the inlays in, all that, that was the beginning of making guitars. And I did it in my, um, the end of my first year in college. So and you want to see something fun? Yes, Paul. All right, so let's do something. See this piece of wood right here? 
Can we take a close up of this? Sure. All right, so we're in the vault. And this is where people come to get the woods for the guitars. If I wet this, you start to get a beginning of what it's going to look like with finish on it. That's wow. outrageous. That's the way God grew that piece of wood. God, that's just unbelievable, right? I just, I mean, that's just scary. Look at this curl that's going yeah. this way. It really looks three-dimensional. It, it does. does. It is three-dimensional. The, the wood's going in and going out, and you're cutting off a 3D thing in, in 2D. Wow. That's what you're doing. Wow. So, I mean, what fun. Now, this has probably already been sold, and you can't have it, which is the best <laughs> thing to tell somebody and as a guitar player that they can't have it, and then they want the next one. <laughs> right. So, look, let's just do another one just for fun, okay? It doesn't look that curly, but if I t take and wet it, I mean, it's just, that's just beautiful. It's like an old violin. Look at that thing. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's it. You know, PRS, you're, it really starts with the wood, and I think that's what's, what attracts all of us. That was the initial attraction, I think, for, for everybody when we saw your guitar. Yeah. It's just the way that. I didn't want it that way. <laughs> I want it to be the way they sound and the way they felt. But if we didn't have something beautiful on it, 80% yeah. of information is brought in with people's eyeballs. Sure. But in the end, how it sounds and how it feels is a big deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I didn't even want it. All the good guitars when I was a kid didn't have truss rod covers, so I didn't put truss rod covers on the guitars. Uh. You know, all the good, all, all the good strats that came in had no back plate over the, tr the trem cavity, so I didn't want to put that on. You know, I, it was just, I don't know. Look, John, if you steal from ten place, one place, you steal from one place, it's stealing. Yeah. If you steal from ten places, it's research. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But you know, it's it's a, it's amazing that that all this time later. You're coming in every day and and building guitars, and you're constantly making tweaks and changes to to your line and improving them. Trying to adding, yeah, yeah, trying to. No, yeah. we never change the jack plate because it works. Right. But if there's something about the way the nuts cut so that it can stay a little better in tune with the tremolo, we'll do the jack. We'll do it. You know, if there's a way that. Um, we can make the pickup have a, a little bit more of a beautiful note to it, we'll do it. Whatever it is that makes a difference, I don't want to change things just for change sake. We change things because we think we can make a better guitar. So what are you going to do? You're going to want to tour? What We're going to, yeah. I, well, we kind of want to see, it's, it's, uh, we, want, we want to see the whole process. We're starting with the wood here. We want to take it all the way through uh, the way you're building guitars here. Look. We're an interesting company. We start literally with logging these trees all the way through marketing the guitars. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's called an integrated line. You know, we're not an assembly house. We're doing it from scratch. Right. We've had other guitar making companies here. They, we don't do what you do. I said, what are you talking about? He says, we order the neck blanks and we order the fretboards cut and we order this. We I, I, he said, we never made this stuff from scratch. Yeah. And I was like, I, my, my mind was blown. I was like, I don't know how to do it any other way. That's the only way we know. Yeah. In fact, you just showed me like a tool you made. You're not, you're just, you just don't yeah. make every step of the guitar. You make some of the tools that go into making them. It's yeah, crazy. So for us, the tools weren't available, so we had to make them. Yeah. What we showed you was a machine that we built that says how a pickup sounds before we ever plug the pickup in. Yeah. But you can't buy that. Yeah. So an engineer made it for us, you know, an electrical engineer. He says, I can make you a tool that'll show you the sound before you ever plug it in. Yeah, right, sure. It took us 20 years to learn how to use that thing. Now, yeah. we, live, now we live by it. Yeah, that's great. So uh, come on, y'all. Join us as we, uh, as we walk through the PRS factory. I hope you have a good time. Oh, yeah, I'm already having a great time, That's Paul. good, all right. Okay, now we're with Rob Carhart, who is the Director of New Products Engineering. And you've been at PRS for 30 years? I have. I, my 30 year anniversary will come up this October. I started with Paul in 1992 and have worked in a variety of different positions here and looking forward to giving Premier Guitar a factory tour today. Yeah, well, we're, and we're, we're starting in the wood room and really, I think most of us when we think about PRS, we really think about it starts with the wood, I mean, with those amazing tops. It does, John. It's a key element, and we obviously try to source the highest quality, best materials from all over the world. These two gentlemen in rough cut behind us uh, process up to five, 6,000 board feet of 
wood in any given week. A lot of material that comes through here, and uh, a lot of the wood is purchased seasonally. Some of it's stored off-site at our mills, and you try to procure that stuff when it's available. And this area is where all the first operations start on PRS guitars. There are a variety of different operations we handle back here, including um, the quality assessment of the wood, sorting, sizing to a workable shape for our manufacturing operations, and then the initial drying processes. All the wood that comes in really goes through a quality control process where we're checking for any aesthetic defects, of course checks, cracks, that type of stuff, and the moisture level of all the wood that comes in here. Uh, depending upon the mill that we get it from, what time of year it is, or what type of wood it, at, it is, it may have a different water content. Sure. We want to monitor that. For us, it's a very important part of building the instrument is how we dry that wood before the manufacturing process, and that all starts back here. Wow, okay, great. Well, I can't wait to see what's next. Okay. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the, one of the drying areas? It sure is, John. So it's part of our rough cut operations, and one of the things that goes on back here, as well as our processing, grading, quality, is the beginning parts of our drying process. So all the different types of wood where we had talked about you know, five or six major different types of wood that are used within our manufacturing process, and then a whole host of exotic pieces. All those woods, be it maple for neck planks or fingerboards, uh, rosewood, mahogany backs, maple tops, they all come in varying different levels of water content in the wood. And one of the things we want to do to ensure that we're building a stable instrument for, the, for many lifetimes to come is to dry that wood out properly before the manufacturing process. Starting back in here in Rough Cut, some of the people you met earlier will take a sample size of the water content of the wood using an electric hydrometer. They'll determine how, um, that, and then how long the wood needs to be processed uh, in one of these drying rooms that you see behind us. They're all standard insulated rooms, bay door front, with a resistance heater in them we will monitor the water content of the wood before it goes in. Depending on how wood it, wet it is, we'll determine how long it's gonna stay in one of these rooms. And as you can see, next to each one of these rooms, there's an indicator giving relative humidity of the room, <coughs> excuse me, and temperature. So wood that may come in here at nine, 10, 12, 14%, may spend a week in here, maybe longer. As the heat increases, the water content will be driven out of the wood. It's a slow process. Rob will record all that information during the drying process. We'll check again the water content of the wood. We bring it below the threshold of what we want to actually hit from a, for a drying number or a water content. And then this stuff, as it goes back out on the shop floor, we'll get a chance to come back up and adjust to the conditions that we have out um, in our wood shop. We use an equilibrium water content, moisture content of wood, meaning that most woods will seek an equilibrium based on the environment that they are in. And that doesn't happen overnight and it's different for different species of woods. So as this wood is driven to say, you know, 4% water content here, then in our conditions on the floor at say 72 degrees and 45% relative humidity, the wood will take several weeks to come back up and stabilize between seven and 9% water content. Later on, as you'll see, all these different batches of wood that go through here have a date associated and a date code on them that will let the different operators and employees here know how long they've gone through the drying process and whether or not they are ready to use uh, for processing and making a guitar. We can take a look in one of these hot rooms right now. Yeah, sure. Look at some fingerboards and neck planks that we have. Well, the, uh, the drying process is so time consuming that there's some, I know some manufacturers, I had a, I had a cheap guitar as a kid that was not, that was very green and it just disintegrated. You're absolutely right, John. And it's a big part of, the, of achieving the overall stability uh, with a guitar is you don't want to have the pieces of wood that you use at dissimilar uh, different moisture contents because as that process stabilizes then you'll see movement and stress relief in right. the wood as well. If you have a guitar that's built 
in very wet conditions and then as you go through a seasonal change even with finish over the guitar um, you, you will see sometimes where that where the moisture is trying to leave the guitar and then leads to instability in the instrument yeah so uh, we really shoot for you know a specific number in here based on our conditions that we're going to make the instrument in um, so that we minimize any of that gaining or or uh, or, or um, losing a moisture you know taken care of properly these guitars are going to be around a lot longer than you and I have and right. that's really our that's our intent we want to deliver a product to the customer um, that they can it's going to be an heirloom they can pass on to a loved one family member and it's it's uh, going to get the opportunity to tell many stories of the life of the guitar and the drying process is really very important to that. Okay, so Rob, what process are we in right now? So John, we took a look at the wood drying and, and getting all that stuff acclimatized to our factory conditions. And now we're in the first part of the body build operation in here. Right now, this gentleman is taking a, a maple top and is going through an edge joining process. This particular uh, book match top has already been milled down uh, to thickness through a variety of different planing operations and he's preparing to match up the book joint and prepare this edge for gluing which is what he's doing right now. We're shooting for uh, a perfect edge joint on there you don't want any gaps to show up obviously in the book match. Now we're gonna he, as he prepares these he'll match them up and obviously with a book match um, you have the corresponding kind of mirrored grain and figure um, on each piece of wood so when what he'll do is uh, match these pieces up and put a hash mark on it that uh, really shows where the best location for these pieces to be matched together is we're going to see that right now if he's happy with the glue wow, joint beautiful and you can see that's a highly figured beautiful oh, piece of maple wow and so originally that was that's cut in half and then split open that's right john that was one billet of wood um, that was resawed and then opened up, you know, to, to form a book match. Well, just beautiful. Right, and he just put a little indicator mark on there, so as the guys go to glue the tops up, they'll have a reference and and um, to glue up so it has a correct book match. And do they grade them like these are? These are all ten tops, right? Or, or you got a variety of different tops. As you can see, um, we have a color coding system that that determines the the species of wood and the grade of it as well, and what product line it's going to be used on. So these guys will get a schedule in here, and it'll cover a variety. There may be custom tops, ten tops. Um, wood library artist package and, and uh, they all correspond to an individual order that we have running through here. And they're all different. That's what they you're are so all different. They really so are. Yeah. And and again, you can you know these are highly figured. They're beautiful at this point. As we go through the tour, you'll you'll really get to see is that is that enhancement through staining and finish as these get further down the line. So the next operation would be. Uh, glue up for these tops over here and we're going to take that book match edge joint surface and glue those two pieces of wood together okay John so after we've milled the top down glued together it gets it will get laminated to a mahogany back in the case of this guitar they've performed just kind of a rough bandsaw cut on the perimeter of this top these two pieces will then get glued together they'll go into these hydraulic presses over here uh, under a significant amount of force uh, for probably six or seven hours. This will then get popped out. We'll clean this up once again as a hand operation on the bandsaw, and then it'll go into our milling area and ready for CNC operations for the back and top of the guitar. John, so we took a look at how the bodies, the different components were laminated together. This is our uh, machining area for bodies for PRS. And what the operations we'll do over here um, really include all the top and back carves, holes for the potentiometers, neck joints, pickups, electronics, and trim cavities over here. And uh, with PRS, we are in a constant state of improvement here, whether it's processes, components, or anything else. One of the things we've been working on the last few years is a changeover in some of our machines in here. Towards the end of the line, you see some newer Dusons. Here's an example of one of our older uh, Fidel 
uh, vertical milling center 4020s. And I wanted to show you really the difference in surface finish that these newer machines uh, are able to process and cut at. So here's an older model where it's pretty obvious you can see, and it's a very good resolution. Oh, yeah, beautiful. But we can see the step over carves and, and the step over lines in here as the ball mill tracks across this guitar and removes wood. Sure. And here's an example from one cut on our newer machine um, just recently where it's a much higher, I guess, like resolution oh, that you right. could say. Really a wow. beautiful cut. Where it makes the guitar a little bit easier to sand and shape and keeps the, the integrity of the car program uh, as well. These machines are able to hold really a plus or minus tolerance of five thousandths of an inch. Uh, and as we have them set up, they're able to hold a little bit tighter with a few of the precise operations we do in regards to the neck joint. And uh, I think probably our through holes are plus or minus two thousandths. Oh. And all that technology um, has really helped us with reproducing uh, on a regular basis a consistent quality right that process. consistency they all come out of the line it, just... it really has and, and this is a great example of uh, and this technology has been around for a long time but back in the day you know we would use pin routers hand routers dupla carver machines and you know although it was a lot more handwork they certainly weren't as consistent as, as these parts are today and it's i think it it represents a, a uh, refined product really over the years all right john so we've taken a look at the body build and machining aspect of, of, of what happens in here the next process is as to body sand and you can see a couple people over here working every element of the guitar then really has to be sanded by hand. So although we have that wonderful resolution uh, from our machining, there is still a lot of rough that needs to be taken out. Um, every really hard line and surface has to be blended over on this guitar. So the operations over here include sanding the top, back, sides, all of our divots out here. They're gonna blend this line in on the belly carve. This round over has to be blended in on both sides. And as you can feel from this one, it's a lot different than the one that we sure. look out over in the roughing area. So um, it's also an important part where we're looking out for any defects or, or issues that may have been revealed during the milling process. You'll get a better view of the finished product here uh, from a quality assurance standpoint as well. So if you discover a defect at this point, what, what do you do? So if it's not a structural problem, um, you, there's an opportunity to perhaps match that guitar up with a different color that would be more oh. suitable. So if it was heavy mineral stain in a maple top and it was originally pegged to be a vintage yellow, uh, it maybe has changed to a darker green or blue guitar where that would still be acceptable and look beautiful. Sure. And then again, if there's any issue of you know, structural crack check or anything else, and the guitar will most likely be cut up at that point if it's not repairable, right? So I started off working in this area, um, you know, 29 years ago, uh, sanding bodies. And I can tell you this crew of people over here, they do a great job. We've got a first and second shift working in these operations for sanding bodies. And they're probably spending on average about 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes on each body. Currently we have it broken down so um, different people depending on their skill level will do different parts of the guitar. So you may have one guy who's uh, you know working on the sides of the guitar and the cutaway, another person who's sanding backs and tops. Okay. After the guitar is sanded it's going to queue up and wait for a neck and or actually the neck's probably done first so after the guitar is sanded um it'll get matched up with the neck and we're going to take a look at the neck manufacturing process next john you have a core neck plank that's gone through the drying process i have an example of a s2 neck plank this is a five quarter piece it's a much smaller uh stock thickness obviously than this neck plank we kind of call the core ones a one piece neck where the headstock and heel is gonna come out of this same piece of neck. And on our S2 line, uh, we glue on an additional piece to achieve the thickness of the heel uh, and the headstock angle. And behind us is kind of a representation of several key stages um, that represent the different operations for both these neck planks. So first we have a core 
base model where we've gone from your neck plank over here to a uh, drawing cut. At this point, this neck after this operation is gonna sit for another two, two and a half weeks at this stage. Wow. Before we do any other operation. Is that just to make it more solid, to really make it hunker in? Or? Certainly part of the process. And, and in a similar vein to what we talked about with drying the, the wood out, um, there, is, there are certain amount, as you start to mill a piece of wood, particularly in this application, where you're removing a tremendous amount of piece of wood from one side. There is sometimes a natural stress relief that can happen with, with that. Sure. Um, when it's predominantly been taken off on one side. This neck may want to bow a little bit and have a slight twist to it. Now, instead of having that, uh, we want to give the neck time to let it make those micro adjustments and then kind of stabilize then we're going to re-level it again before we take the next operation. You don't really want to run a neck with any inherent um, tension in it and then carve it within a, within a um, quick period of time. So we, what you're seeing here probably represents, um, you know, 30 days of manufacturing time, two weeks alone for this, and then another couple of weeks to go through the various stages. Those main stages, as they're represented here, really, from this stage after drying, uh, we'll do a rough perimeter cut. We'll cut the uh, insert for the truss rod and the retaining nuts for the truss rod. The rod will be installed. What we call ears will be glued onto the neck. The truss rod insert will be installed. The neck then gets another side profile and uh, profile cut to get closer to that finish. Uh, headstock shape. At that point, a finger nor fingerboard will get laminated to the neck. It goes through a carving process, then fingerboard leveling operations and threading and uh, veneering wow. as well. We're going to take a look at some of those operations next, John. It's amazing how labor intensive the neck is. It really is, and and again, it, the the you know we have found really over the last 35, 36 years of manufacturing guitars that it's been key for us in between these machining stages to kind of let the neck do its thing and have a period you'll notice there's going to be racks of necks over here where we've got built-in queue times between these operations to allow for that that stress relief and changes that happen within the neck uh, you know what you don't want to do is have a bowed piece of wood force it down on a jig carve it take it off the jig and it and it springs back into sure. boat shape. So we've all seen that over the years with uh, with various guitars, and we try to eliminate that by allowing for some of those micro movements between manufacturing stages to deliver a flat, true neck at the end of the process. Okay, Rob, where are we now? Okay, so we've gone through the major machining operations uh, for our neck construction. So now we've got a neck with a partially rounded fingerboard on it. And at this point, it moves into this area. We do another series of operations. We do the final radius to the fingerboard over here, uh, be it a seven and a quarter for a JM Silver Sky or our standard 10 inch radius on most of our other guitars. After that's done, the neck will be threaded over here, um, which you can see back in this area. And we do really kind of a standard threading operation with an arbor press and um, various carriages. There's a huge different variety of fret wires over there depending on what the model is and the type of wire we use on it. Once the neck is fretted it goes into manual sanding operation. I think we probably hit this area at lunchtime so it's a little quiet over here but essentially similar to the bodies they are going to sand every surface of the neck. Um, so all the sharp lines along the headstock uh, any hard transitions that we see around the heel, obviously all those have got to be smoothed over. As you can see again, you know, the resolution is pretty tight on this part. Right. And, the, and certainly more than just the general shape is there um, for the sander. So they're really take, trying to take out any of those machine marks and blend the hard lines. Uh, there's a variety of quality control aspects that go over here, everything to um, inspecting the inlay work that was done to a variety of different dimensional checks in this area. So we've got specifications that need to be checked after sanding in regards to 
the headstock thickness, the thickness at first, third, fifth, seventh, ninth fret, uh, the width of the heel, the width of the, the uh, nut slot in particular to make sure we've maintained a tight tolerance through our sanding operations. And we know we came in with a very tight part off our CNC operations. We want to maintain those shape and critical dimensions as the neck goes through our hand operations and sand it over here. After the sanding, they'll go through a final QC work. Um, and if they're bolt on neck, they move, may move on to the finish hall. If it's a set neck guitar, it's gonna go head over to our neck body assembly area and meet up with the body. We took a look at those operations earlier and we can see how those two parts come together now. Great. So John, we're in the neck and body assembly area here at PRS Guitars and we've just taken a look um, at all the various operations that went into building and sanding the body and then the same thing on the neck side of things. Uh, and this area is where the two components come together. So you have all those uh, hours and hours of work gone to a point where we're really going to put these things together to make an instrument. So at PRS Guitars, um, on our set neck guitars, we use kind of a large dovetail. So where you can see um, the heel is, is certainly wider at one end than it is at the other end, and a corresponding neck joint cut in the body. As these machines, uh, as these parts come off machines, uh, the neck is cut with an interference fit versus the neck joint, meaning that this part is intentionally cut probably five or six thousandths over the size of the neck joint and will not fit in here at this stage. Um, and the way that's achieved is by hand, someone with a significant amount of experience uh, will then sand off a little bit of wood on each side of this dovetail and then check the fit again. That usually takes a couple swipes as they check the fit you want to have it tight enough so that there's excellent contact area between the sides of the neck joint and the neck. Uh, if it's too tight and you force it in, it squeezes all the glue, glue out. Uh, if it's too, too loose and you're depending on too much glue to form a strong joint. So um, it's really a finesse operation. These guys do a great job at it. As they are setting that neck, they are also verifying and in some case making small adjustments to the back of the heel by sanding that um, as well on this block to finalize the neck angle for the guitar. Wow. So depending upon the type of bridge the guitar is going to get, uh, whether it's a PRS trim, a Floyd, a two-piece, one-piece bridge, we have a different what we call neck angle or it's called rake sometimes. It all has to do with um, the overall height that the bridge is going to set up and it really is determined by how this neck angle is set. The way we do that after we put these two parts as we're as we're fitting these two parts is as we'll have a straight edge down the neck that hangs over the bridge area and we kind of take a simple measurement between that straight edge and the top of the guitar body which are all a little different depending on you know how they're sanded and then we'll meet that specification during the assembly process. After neck and body assembly, the guitar goes through another series of, uh, it gets clamped up. It's gonna stay in here uh, for several hours. Of course, the neck joints, you know, cleaned up of residual glue and everything else during the clamp up process. Then this entire unit is gonna get finish sanded again. So they'll use a higher grit remove any scratches or slight imperfections that may have incurred during the assembly process. Um, and it'll move on through, through a QC area and then eventually move out into finish. Okay, so Rob, at this point, we've, uh, we've seen what goes into the neck, a lot into that, a lot into putting the body together. Neck and body are now together after a ton of sanding and drying, et cetera. Where are we now? Right, so we are now in the base coat finish operations for Paul Reed Smith guitars. As you said, we've got the neck and body assembly together. We've got things that actually look like full guitars in yeah. here. And this is where we begin really the finish process of all the guitars that come through here. There's, as you pan around here, we've got set neck guitars, we've got bolt on guitars, we've got necks, but essentially what happens in this area in the first part would be our staining, our grain filling, our coats after grain fill and preparation for our base coat spray, um, and then other preparation work done to the guitar 
in terms of taping off areas that are not going to get finished on them preparation for spray. So the first thing I'd like to take a closer look at uh, are some of the staining operations. And so we offer a wide variety of different color combinations and options. And, I know on your site it is it is so cool to see all those options and you can yeah. It's really amazing and they, and and from our private stock team they're coming up with new stains uh, you know, on a monthly basis. This is an example of a guitar uh, after it's gone through the wood shop where the top has been stained and this is going to go th through some other operations which we'll take a look at in a second uh, before it goes in for spray. So a lot of our stains are achieved using a variety of different techniques and sometimes multiple colors. So this is an example where there's still, you can see in the trim cavity, um, a, the, the, the initial stain coat was one color and then it gets stained again with another color. In some cases, the guitars will get lightly sanded out between those staining coats to achieve the color. I think we've called them uh, sand outs depending on the, on the color. All that happens in this area. In this particular model with a curly maple neck and you could see the kind of greenish bluish stain undercoat now that it's being hit with the, uh, the red to pink stain there and it's wow yeah really bringing out the curl in this particular neck and and uh this is the process to achieve the purple iris color that we offer wow yeah and as we had talked about earlier john you know there's this the natural beauty in all these pieces of wood and then and hopefully and i think it's kind of on display in this case we're really we're adding and enhancing to that natural figure this curly maple neck really popped once it's oh. once it's hit and goes through our staining process. Um, and you can really see the contrast between the, uh, the light and dark figuring there. And uh, it's gonna be a beautiful guitar. God, isn't that amazing? That's just found in nature. Isn't that unbelievable? Uh, yeah. And so pleasing to us too. Oh you know? yeah. So is this, okay, with a flamey zebra-esque neck like that, is this a private stock? Or so this a... is probably a wood library guitar, is that right? Yeah. So uh, essentially we've got a program um, that our dealers allow, they order limited runs of guitars that have a combination of either materials and electronics configurations that aren't normally offered through our regular line. So in this case we see a, uh, this is a single cut trem with a curly maple neck um, and it almost looks, it's got the trim up route in it as well. So it's a, kind of a unique wow. unique piece there, not something we normally carry. And, and dealers can do runs, I think, in probably quantities of 10, maybe even five of yeah. a unique item um, you know, to offer their customers. That's cool. a really cool thing that PRS does with some, of their, with some of their dealers that you can order something specific for your shop yes. and have a run out of your And your I'll tell shop. you, I think it's a great program. Our head of sales, Jim Collin, you know, worked on developing this. And in today's, you know, where we are now with internet sales and you can check available product right in hundreds of stores right. in just minutes and really all over the world. Yeah. The fact that you're able to, with this program, we can offer a dealer, maybe a smaller dealer, something unique that they have. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, it's kind of a nice program. Yeah, what a thrill. So John, we've taken a look at the staining and grain filling processes. Right now we're in one of our spray holding rooms. So we have guitars in various stages out here, depending upon, uh, whether you see some with color on them, some with clear coat, others that are on deck to get their first coat of finish, which is what I wanted to talk about now. Um, next to us, we have a spray room where we're doing our initial base coat spray operations. And what they'll do is five individual passes with a slight dry time in between there to build up the, the base coat before color coats and clear. Um, typically, that coat needs to dry for two or three days after spraying and then we'll, we'll go to a sanding operation, which levels out the finish, and then the guitar will go to, through a prep operation before color coats and top coats. And you said five coats? So it's five individual passes yeah. that they'll do to spray on and there. And these are just, just They're very thin. Paper thin. As, as I, right, so our goal, and believe me, we check a percentage of guitars out of every spray batch, is to have between four and six mils or four and six thousandths of an inch of finish after those five passes. That is just... Right, and that's after spray and sandling, sanding. So we want to keep that finish really as thin as possible, just like 
Paul was talking to us earlier, and we're, we're really trying to develop a very hard, thin finish. And the base coat uh, is obviously a big part of that. And we'll move on to some of the other operations now. So John, now we're in the, our base coat sanding area. And we've got two samples here. We just looked at some of these guitars getting sprayed. So this one has a layer of the cab acrylic on it. And it's, it's probably about eight thousandths, nine thousandths thick. Behind us, they're gonna sand this entire guitar down using a series, probably starting with 300 and ending with 400 grit and get this guitar prepped for color coats uh, and clear coats. So as you can see, and if, I don't know whether the camera will pick this up, this one's nice and shiny, but if we look close at it, there's orange peel on it and imperfections from how it lays out um, during the finished process. Well, we want this to be absolutely smooth. So this one you can feel now that it's been sanded. Right. Um, it's perfectly flat, there's no orange peel, and it's ready to get color coats and and uh, clear coats applied to it. Okay. Yep. So will this one get, a, for instance, will this get color over it or is this gonna be a clear? Right, so in this case, this guitar is gonna be com most likely completely opaque. It may be a metallic finish or, or a flat color finish. So the entire guitar will get color coated uh, and then get a clear coat over that. On some of the other instruments that are getting worked on behind us that have a stained top, the binding may get masked off and it'll get a color coat on the back and the neck and then the entire guitar will get uh, color coated. So it depends on the model and the color requirement for you know every guitar that we have running. So where are we now? So John, we're in one of the uh, base coat, color coat holding rooms, uh, a different one adjacent to our spray room here where we do color coats before clear coats. I have this guitar as an example of one. We looked at a, a 300 sanded guitar where the base coat was sanded nice and flat. The next stage would be to apply color to that guitar. In this case, the top is stained, so it's been taped off and masked off where we didn't want to get any color. And the back of this guitar has been sprayed uh, this translucent color here. The next step for this guitar will be to move on to clear coats. Now, this is maybe jumping out of turn a little bit, but you've always paint on your serial numbers and when does that happen in the process? Uh, we, that typically happens right before clear coat so okay. if the guitar is going to get um, any type of uh, like in this case where we have paint sprayed on the actual base coat yeah. the, sign the uh, serial number and then ten top designation if it needs one will go on at this point before clear coats. Okay and is that is that what this indicates there? On this one is marked as a uh, 10 in the corner. Yeah, yeah so that's right. that's where they put the, the magic is. 10. Right you have the year and then a sequential serial number somewhat and then a 10 yeah. on there. We can't see the top because this one's taped off when we don't want to get any of that uh, neck and back spray on the top of the guitar. But we so know it's flaming. We know it's a good one over there. <laughs> yeah. So does it it's always kind of amazed me to see that that hand-drawn serial number and uh, Right. Yeah, that's was some, something very specific to PRF. Uh, it is and there's been you know uh, companies done a variety of things over the years. I, I remember starting here and, and thinking the same thing like well, that's that's kind of unique. It's not like a stamp yeah. number or anything else. And uh, I, I kind of like the hand touch on I it. I do too. I think it's just it's just it's just cool. It's like yeah. the next one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, John. So we took a look at some of the color coat applications. The next part of the process uh, would be clear coat. So you have it, an example of guitar. This one's gone through all the previous steps of stain. Uh, and color coats and also has a clear coat applied to it and most of these guitars behind us here are nitrocellulose uh, top coat on the guitar. This particular one if you're to look closely at it even though it looks nice and shiny uh, and, and reasonably flat finish it's an off the gun finish so the next step is going to be sanding that uh, that clear coat down before polishing. So they go through a variety of grits here, I think starting off with a 1500, very, very high grit, and then moving to a 3000. And you can kind of feel the tackiness on this versus this guitar. Oh, sure. Right, so any, again, any of that orange peel, again, what we're trying to achieve here is a very hard, thin finish. 
Again, I think the total mill build after sand on top coat is probably about four, four to five mils. You know, you consider human hair is about three. So it's not much thicker than that. And then this guitar is gonna go through a uh, buffing and polishing process. And then it will move into final assembly for, for uh, parts and final setup. So Rob, you guys have been making pickups like from very early on. Like, That's like right, John. PRS makes things that makes the whole guitar. So tell me about what, what goes into this. So we do wind our own pickups here. Um, we, there are, our bobbins are designed by PRS. We have other manufacturers that produce those plastic parts for us, but they're all under our design. They're all proprietary at this point. And essentially we've developed a variety of different humbucker and single coil pickups over the years. As you can see right next to us, we have a multitude of wires that we use for different applications. And it's really been, you know, a 25, 30 year research wow. project. And as we were talking about earlier, uh, some of it designed off a of reverse engineering kind of iconic designs and some that we've learned through our own discovery of pickups as they apply to our particular models. And they're all wound in house. This is where the winding's done. And then we can take a look at where some of the other cover assembly and wax potting is done. Wow. Yeah, it was really interesting just talking to Paul a few minutes ago. He was, uh, before we started this, and he was, he was talking about working with Mayor about these pickups now. And they, I mean, it just never stops. It really, it really does. And you know, the, it's, I mean, it is continual refinement. So we are currently making that model. Yeah. We, we, but we are also, I know Chuck had a, had a uh, tray of new pickups that we're sending John. That's going on an ongoing basis the more that we learn so if and as paul said if we feel like we can make an improvement um and add value to our product and and as an end result give a better value to our customer that's kind of the mode that we operate in so we've got a, a whole variety of steps just as with anything else that go on with pickup manufacture right now i think we're taking a look at uh, some of the shrouds are getting applied to these uh, humbuckers right here but essentially after co after the coils are wound they're going to come into this room They'll get leads attached to those wires. A humbucker pickup, two coils will get attached to a base plate uh, with a lead wire. They may or may not get a, a pickup cover depending upon uh, the, the what pickup model it is. And then some of our most of our pickups go through a wax potting operation as well. And the pickups also go through a QC check. As we look around this room, you can see at a variety of different stages, there's multimeters on the bench top so that we can check the integrity of the coils throughout the process. As we just took a look at how fine all that pickup wire is and anyone who's dealt with or built pickups realizes that they are susceptible to breaking. So it's throughout that process we're going to check continuity to make sure that we don't have an open coil within the process sure. and that we're not putting any more labor or processes into a to an open coil and it does it does happen on occasion it's so that's oh, part those of are, our quality check they're so fragile yeah they really are yeah the other part of the operations in this room are are um it is our electronics area so we have all of our sub assemblies for guitars in the form of drop-ins and electronics are also assembled in this area where we'll take assemblies for potentiometers and switches and a combination of those as they're going to be put together for various models also get pre-assembled in this room before they're kitted and then eventually uh, assembled on a guitar in our final assembly area. So John, we're in the final assembly area and this is where we put, install all that various hardware on the guitars, pickups, bridges, electronics, components, tuning pegs, the nut we string the guitar up, make sure the setup is correct and all the electronics function and work um, before the guitars go on to final check. So we have a variety of different those operations taking place in different locations. We typically will have a team of people who will install items like tuning pegs and strap buttons and bridges uh, and sometimes pickups and then there'll be an, another group of people that complete the assembly of the guitar and do a final uh, final check to it. We brought a couple examples out here of finished guitars. I have a an S2 uh, 594 double cut and you have a Santana model right there that's completely yeah. strung up. 
I think it's kind of neat. And it's when you look around this room, um, you know, what you don't see is 50 guitars that are all the same style and color, right? Yeah. It's, it really covers the whole full rainbow and spectrum of products that we do in here uh, with a variety of different scale lengths, finishes, uh, electronics packages available, different pickups and d different finishes, whether the and fingerboards, materials, everything, it all comes together in this this room. And uh, it's interesting as we walk through the factory, you kind of see that throughout our manufacturing sure. facility where we have all these different guitars running through somewhat similar processes and break off into different cells depending on on what the application is required for the guitar, and it all comes together here. It's it's interesting too because okay, the McCarty and the Santana, different pickups, different bridge, different tuners. Now, do so. I, I, I guess somebody has to kind of assemble the different parts for different guitars, and then they're do they put them together like a package? Is that That's the way? That's right, it works? exactly. So what we do now is as these guitars come through and you know, we have a material resource planning system that we use that tracks the sub assemblies and parts of the guitars as they go through different areas and we attach labor and operations and materials to them. As they come into this room, as this guitar goes through a QC check before any parts are put on it, uh, the information um, essentially gets translated to people back in our electronics area to where we build a kit for the guitar okay. that will have all those associated electronics pickups, potentiometers, the tone pots, correct wiring, tuning pegs, and we'll kit that in a guitar. You can see behind us we have a rack of guitars with some kits on top that oh, correspond okay. to each one. Sure. So yeah. then the assembler is going to go over there, grab the guitar, and there'll be a, be a a sequential number that matches on the kit that he's going to grab, and they'll go assemble the guitar and have the right parts pulled for them, and um, to keep it a, a, as an efficient process as possible. If there is a custom order, can they change it at this point? Do they? I mean, like they, or, or would that happen through the general assembly here? Like, so, say you want a different pickup. Say you wanted Paul's guitar pickups on a Santana. Could right, you... so typically that information would be contained into the guitar very soon after it started. Okay. So if it was requiring, um, if it was requiring a different set of pickups, let's say it's a wood library run. Yeah. Basically within the guitar, we have an, an identifier oh. that calls out the model and category of the guitar. And within that long skew with all these different letters and numbers, um, does call out what type of pickups it gets, what type of bridge, what's the finish on the bridge, is wow. it nickel, is it gold, are they vintage tuners, are they, you know, phase 3.2 tuners, you know, is a bone nut, synthetic nut, all those things are all, that information is all called out um, within a model well, identification system on the guitar. Do you pulled. keep that on file, like kind of a birth certificate that talks about all the ingredients? It, yeah, there is, there is kind of a... And we call it a mod cat, but it's yeah. the model category identifier yeah. that that information is is then in, in contained into it. And I think now recently it's switched over to just a numerical uh, number that calls out all those different entities and, and you know, f type everything from the type of finish that it gets to the type of material it's used on the guitar body, neck, fingerboard, and of course, all the stuff we're looking at in this area, which is... Uh, all the hardware and electronics appointments. So Rob, where, we're in a different part of the factory. We are. Where are we now? Okay, so physically we are upstairs <laughs> above the wood shop area that we were in a little while ago, and this is our SE inspection area. So we have a variety of our SE line guitars behind us. And in this area, we have a whole team, 15 or 16 people in here. Their job is as we receive um, overseas guitars in from our SE line. We unbox all those guitars and essentially go through a in full inspection very similar that we would do downstairs in our final assembly area. So these guys are going to unbox the guitar. They're going to do a visual inspection on the fit and finish of the guitar and then they're going to get into the functionality of the electronics, make sure everything's operating okay. They're also going to go through all the uh, setup specifications that we have and we have certain requirements for the SEs, just like we do with electrics in regards to 
string height, um, truss rod adjustments, and uh, you know bridge adjustments and everything else. They have a, a specific um, elements that they're reviewing in here and making sure that they meet our specifications. So every guitar that gets distributed to um, a dealer in domestic in the USA or to Canada goes through an inspection process here before it goes into a dealer or customer's hands. And then we have a similar operation where this is handled overseas and PRSGI through European and Asian distribution. Yeah, I heard some of your techs literally playing every note all the way up and down that. That's neck. one of the checks that they're going to do, yeah. along with making sure you know, like general stuff, like the pickups are working. Is is part of that setup? Do we have any high frets? Do we have any you know buzzing issues or anything else? And that's as part of the play check operation is to go through there. If they find an issue, do they do they fix it here or do they bring it down to excellent tech question? Downstairs? So it's it uh, they are able to handle. Um, Quite a few repairs here. If it's a simple setup adjustment, obviously that's handled right at the bench. Yeah. We do have the opportunities if they are small finish issues um, to address those here. And then anything major with these guitars, it's kind of a different uh, system to where we wouldn't probably dive into anything, you know, fixing a structural issue or major finish repair. Sure. Um, we would work with our partner. Cortec to address those type of issues. And then, you know, as an as another really general step, we didn't get a chance to talk about in our core guitars, um, but I've talked about it on to tours before, where we take guitars that essentially are ready to ship, both through our SC line and our core line. I'm involved in the SC line where we have a meeting um, with a group of managers from this area and some other people in the company will unbox guitars that have gone through this inspection process and we pass them around the room down in one of our conference rooms and go over all the quality aspects again. So oh. we're really getting a snapshot of what the dealer or customer would see out of the box, out of the case, and, and we're reviewing the work that Cortec is doing along with um, our associates up here. And, and you know, I've the 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 development of these guitars and I think the 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 quality and really value to the customer I'm personally very proud of how this whole project has developed over the last 20 years these are awesome guitars that that are being made by with really with our our partners uh, through Cortec and and just like with any other aspects of, of PRS that relationship um, is built on a lot of communication back and forth, and I, I can't speak for how other manufacturers handle it. We have a pretty intimate relationship with that manufacturer on quality control, but also, you know, component design, plating stuff, uh, electronics design. Anytime we're releasing a new model, they go through a similar prototype and stuff. Will send us versions of new pickups that we're going to then test here and approve, and uh, it has really been a great back and forth with with Cortec. They've been an excellent part. Of, they're a big part of the growth, obviously, with this project, and I think that they feel strongly about the relationship and the things that are important to that, which is really value to our customer. You know, a level of trust between us and quality and attention to detail. So right. although this may not be an ex as an expensive as a core USA model, um, we want to deliver the same value to our customers. We sure. want people to open up the, the case and be very pleased with their purchase. And uh, it's why we're going over 100% of these. And I think our, our, um, our partners at Cortec have, have really bought into that. And I, I think it's a different relationship than um, than other companies have had in the in the past, and it, it's really been a great thing. It's led to development of some beautiful guitars and really a very s solid, what I feel is affordable and value for your money product oh, line. I've got an SE1 that I think I paid three hundred dollars for, and yeah. I've literally toured the world with that. It's a great played to on hear. sessions, played TV shows, played with, played everywhere, big tours, and it's, I mean. It's just a great guitar, regardless of the price. It's a great guitar. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. Yeah. And and like I said, to maintain that, um, you know, our our chief executive officer, he meets with these guys daily and and certainly weekly. And then we'll have the whole engineering team involved in in Zoom and Teams meetings with 
representatives and engineers from their companies so that we can work on these projects together. It is not just putting in a purchase order and, and leaving it at that. Right. And and um, <laughs> that never works. It doesn't work. And I, I'll tell you, it's been great how they kind of ha have embraced who doesn't want to be part of making the best product you can possibly yeah. make at any given price point and delivering that to a customer. So I, I, I think they it's been great relationship up to this point. Things are working really well. And and um, we're, I'm very proud of this product line. We can take a look at some of the quality yeah. checks. We're Let's doing. see it. Okay, so we've been through it from the drying room to the whole enchilada, and this is the last, the last step. That's right, John. We've gone all the way from rough cut right through to final assembly, and we really are at the end of the line, um, really from an operational standpoint. So this is our casing area, um, and as we had talked about, now we've got a completed guitar in here. It really does receive the last QC check. Um, for the most part at this point and as well as putting all the case candy in and and um, preparing the guitar for shipment the people back here will do one last quality check on the guitar mostly for any uh, finish issues as really the setup stuff has been gone through they'll record the serial number and then some other administrative work based on you know what warehouse it's going to go into what uh, and what dealer it may be going to. Behind us, we can see a pallet of guitars that were cased up today and are ready to move back to our shipping area to go out to dealers and some hopefully some happily, happy customers, oh, right? Oh, definitely. Are be receiving these pretty <laughs> yeah. soon. How could you not be happy yeah. opening up that case? I'll, I'll tell you, and it's and I hope, you know, it's funny with, as we were taking a look at these things, it's, it's a big thing that Paul are, always talks about in that moment when you're either driving home from the store or receive a shipment in the mail and the guitar shows up, uh, hopefully when people open these things up, they'll be really happy and pleased and, and they'll have made a purchase on an instrument that's going to last them a lifetime and serve them well and they'll, they'll really bond and be happy with. Yeah, that's definitely like a heritage guitar. You, that, that will uh, yeah. that'll be around for generations. Yeah, absolutely. So it was great giving you guys a tour here. I got to tell you, I want to thank all three of you, uh, and certainly John and Perry and Chris. You guys are top shelf as well. It's been, been a pleasure to have you in here and take a look at our little factory and how we make PRS guitars in here. And I hope you guys enjoyed yourself. And, oh, it's yeah. amazing. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, can't thank you enough. And yeah. uh, please uh, take a minute to subscribe below. We'll keep you up to date on all this great gear coming your way. And PRS, can't thank you enough for having us. Till next time. Take care.